What's up, everybody? All right, let's give it a few minutes. Let's make sure everybody gets in here. You know, we got to get the dogs quieted down. The kids are uh, running around in the background. I know what it's like to corral everybody. I am lucky enough to be in the most expensive hot desk in Atlanta. Signed lease two weeks before COVID, but lucky for y'all, you're mostly at home, which is nice, or in your corporate hospital office. All right, everybody, uh, we're going to get cracking one minute after two. Could not be more excited to have you all here with us. A uh, couple housekeeping notes. Um, I've got a chat up there. A um, couple things for you all to know. Uh, I like to do giveaways, guys. I like to spice it up. We're going to do lots of fun giveaways. I personally designed this. One. Okay, I didn't design it. I sent it off to a designer. But check this out. We're going to be giving this bad boy away. Oh yeah, we're gonna give away those throughout. And then we got a $100 gift card, Amazon gift card, cause nobody's going to Starbucks right now. Unfortunately, I can't wait to give out Starbucks. But anyway, so we're giving away gift cards. We're gonna have fun and this is gonna be super educational. I've got two superstars with me that'll introduce themselves momentarily. Uh, Lauren has worked with me for the better part of a decade, helps manage our largest accounts, uh, managing upwards of several million a month in media spend on the digital side. And, and Matt's a phenomenal uh, account executive over at uh, Salesforce on the uh, healthcare and life sciences side. So he has a ton, a wealth of knowledge on how technology can help increase patient acquisition and nurture patients throughout the continuum. So they'll introduce themselves a bit further here momentarily, but I'm happy to have you all here. This is fun. We get to talk about how to acquire more patients. This is a crazy year. We've been doing a lot of nurturing of uh, nurturing of healthcare marketers throughout this and a lot of education this year. And I'm excited to invite a few friends along with us. Y'all don't really want to hear about Cardinal, but I'm going to tell you anyways, real quick. We started uh, almost 11 years ago, 11 years and a few months. Um, been helping medical practices ever since. Uh, our first primary care we, we brought on 11 years ago, still a client today. The thing I'm most proud of, though, is we won Best Places to Work uh, a month ago because when COVID hit, we did not back off. No furloughs, no layoffs, no pay reductions, none of that. We doubled down knowing more uh, healthcare providers were going to have to go to the Internet to find patients than ever before. And that plan worked. And we're excited to be here with you guys uh, to talk through that. Cardinal helps everything from a two location primary care up to a four home location, behavioral health, community hospitals and specialty clinics and dental in between. So uh, just about anything, if we can help you acquire patients uh, through digital means, that's something Cardinal can help with. And I know Salesforce feels the same way. In fact, they have a wider breadth of services than we do. Without further ado, I don't like talking about myself much. Uh, Lauren, go ahead and introduce yourself uh, and tell them, tell them what's going on. Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Lauren Leone. Uh, I'm the VP of Client Services here at Cardinal. Um, I also spend a good portion of my time uh, helping new business. So really sitting down with organizations like yourself and talking about what are the gaps in your current marketing? What does your in-house team look like? Where do you need additional support? And how can we make sure that each dollar that you're spending on a daily basis is as effective as it can possibly be? Uh, I look forward to kind of talking you guys through what I have seen in, in the industry, what has changed, and some of the tactics that uh, we can hopefully deploy for some of you guys in the future. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, good intro. She's being very humble, very humble. <laughs> All of her clients know to the killer, man, it's more media than you'd ever imagine. So, so sharp. Uh, and uh, there's a reason for a lot of our clients' success. Matt, what's going on? How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Alex. How are you? Couldn't be more jazzed up. I'm two Starbucks half caps in a Coke Zero in today, baby. So good. how'd you get to Salesforce and what excites you about being there? Yeah, yeah. Good question. So uh, I had about 10 years in healthcare tech with a number of different EHR companies before I found my way to Salesforce. Uh, the healthcare and life science vertical was starting to grow. And specifically within the marketing cloud segment of what Salesforce offers to the market, uh, we found that a, a lot of healthcare related companies, not just providers, but uh, life science companies as well, and pharma, med device, and, and some on the payer side as well, were starting to really think about the way that they could engage with patients differently. And that's uh, most of the projects that I work on. Um, happy to be here and, and excited for the conversation today. 
Yeah, and a lot of the provider groups, I, we don't work with a ton of farmer or anything else, but you, you came into a Salesforce at such a fun time for the provider groups. There's a, oh my God, we can go straight to the consumer and recruit yeah. patients off the street. We don't have to wait for provider referrals. So you and I both in a very exciting time and uh, to help providers navigate that. Uh, what does it mean from the services side and you from the tech side? So yeah. interesting. And guys, we happen to work with Matt with a number of clients and it's been really fun to integrate the services in tech. I can tell you, uh, once the provider groups are advanced enough uh, and are able to use the tech, it's a hell of an accelerator for patient acquisition. So you're going to love uh, hearing what Matt's got to talk about with how Salesforce helps uh, in just a little bit. Um, the agenda for today, let's set the table. We're going to talk about omnichannel marketing and why is it important? So how have things changed uh, over the last, what, seven months we're in quarantine? Hate to date this what's going to be on demand webinar, but seven months, we're in like quarantine week 30 something. I don't know, election coming soon, hit the polls. We're going to have a poll on here too. And we're going to talk about everything from how the healthcare consumers change, what she cared about last year, what she cares about this year, and if we should totally pivot marketing to care about it next year, or if we just need some band-aids there. When we talk about omni-channel marketing, what are we referring to? Is it just email? And then I nurture the patient along after the fact for reactivations or this includes some kind of display ads and social media. What all does that encompass? So that's going to be fun. We're going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about how technology can merge with services, become quite the accelerant. Of course, we're a patient acquisition agency, so everything is geared around how do we get more patients in the door? So Lauren's going to walk us through that. And then really fun stuff, next level pro move stuff. We're going to talk about closing loop. How do we know which marketing platforms help drive which patients. So we're going to talk about closing the loop through using technology and marrying your marketing platforms to your CRM. And I do not specifically vouch for Salesforce is the best. All right. So uh, then we're going to open things up for Q&A. I think I've got you guys for an hour. My watch is out of battery. So I've got you for an hour. We're going to get through this in about 34 minutes, open it up for Q&A. But I've got a chat. Swipe right, swipe right. See you over there in the chat. I don't know if it's right for everybody, but I got the chat. Feel free uh feel free to ask questions throughout i'll help break things up and uh first person to ask a question that i like gets the first godfather marketer t-shirt okay and yes it's subjective i get to pick the question all right guys let's get rolling let's get rolling so how has the pandemic changed the healthcare consumer it's changed it's changed her immensely it's changed her immensely and i think you're all wondering we know she cares about safety is that the top priority it is how do i address that does my copy change? Does my creative, my landing pages? What do I need to address? How serious do I need to be? And where do I need to place that emphasis? We're going to talk about all that today. How important is telemedicine? Does she still want to call, email, live uh, appointments, chat? How does she want to interact with us? We're going to talk about all that as well. Uh, we're going to talk about how they want to educate themselves in the different stages of the funnel. What content? Do I need a blog? If I'm writing on the blog, what do I need to address? Do I still address the same types of topics? Is there any way to nurture someone if I'm in a high acuity type provider group all the way through the funnel now? What matters? And so the healthcare consumers changed dramatically. Last year, I'll tell you, proximity and reputation were the top one or two things that she cared about before booking an appointment with you. Proximity and reputation. This year, it's all about safety. If I'm going to bring my mom into that nursing home, I want to see your infection and safety protocols. How often are you cleaning? How do you keep people away? How often are you testing the nurses? We're going to talk about how to address all that through your copy and landing pages. Uh, yes, this, this presentation just got a chat. This presentation will be emailed to all of you fine folks that registered. And thank you. We had a record registration list for this one. Very excited about it. Clearly, this is a topic on many of your minds. Uh, and so hopefully we'll be shedding some light. I, I think you'll find this entertaining. All right, guys. Remember, first question that I like gets an awesome T-shirt. I think it's awesome. Whatever. You guys can choose to get Starbucks gift cards if you don't want. I found uh, our team found some really fun stats, really, really fun stats. And this was even enlightening to me. Those that book appointments run three times more searches than those who didn't. You're patients are the ones that are the most thorough and Googling things the most, and they're not going to Bing, sorry, it doesn't matter. They're going to Google and they're Googling things way more. So is it okay just to have your location page that says Atlanta Urgent Care? Well, I'm not so sure because if she's 
doing three times the amount of searches. She's probably saying, if my son has a runny nose, do I need to bring him in? Which is the best urgent care around me? Urgent care near me, right? So we're gonna need content uh, across the spectrum. We're gonna talk about that in a little while. Verticals such as physical therapy, and we saw, what did we see recently? Nursing homes, optometry also fall into this uh, category as high as 80 to 90% are using search engines to begin their selection, guys. So low acuity, huge, really hugely driven by search, and it's only increased. Personally, I hate this pandemic, but it has not hurt digital marketing agencies. We are no longer going to our PCP and getting that provider referral. We're no longer driving down Peachtree Street and seeing that billboard. No longer listening to the radio on our way into work. So guess where you're going? Guess where she's going? She's going to the DigiWebs and she's going to look for you on there. And that's how you're going to find her. So very exciting times. We've had a record breaking year. I'd rather the pandemic be over and just get back to normal personally. But hey, that's where we're at. So um, Greg, Greg, is there a way to tie service cloud to sales cloud dashboards? My team has to toggle back and forth to answer from sales to service. Matt, I have no idea what the answer to that is. Greg, you got a t-shirt. Matt, what the hell's the answer to this? Yeah, great, great question. So uh, from a Salesforce point of view, there's a lot of different configurations of how people have set up their, their system. The different platforms that you use from Salesforce, the different uh, uh, tools that you put together, absolutely can integrate. And the ability to show you how to do that could be found in a number of different places. So. Definitely engage directly with your Salesforce team. I'm sure they want to engage with you. They can actually dig in and go inside your, your system to see how you've got it set up and to show you what to do. Ultimately, the answer is yes. There's a number of self-help tools available as well. So if you go to our Trailblazer community, definitely something you can find online. Log in using your Salesforce account. Uh, you'll be able to find any number of self-help uh, self search articles that will show you what to do. So contact your team. I would think integrating Salesforce products, not so difficult. Where I've run into trouble is with these third party things and you try to go the cheap route and get an email campaign that's not part of or journey builder and you try to integrate it with Salesforce. They say they all do it well and come on, they don't. You gotta go with Salesforce products. All right, moving along guys. We know reputation is important. It was the number one thing last year. It, that behind safety, reputation is still very important. When they're reviewing providers, yes, they wanna see your safety protocol. Proximity not is important because they can do telehealth at this point. Uh, or come in with a mask on, right? Because we're allowing a lot more people in. Uh, patients still review using reviews. I've said this a million times, won't beat it up again, but please get on some kind of review solicitation software. Salesforce has it, you got BirdEye, you got Podium, you got all these companies that do that kind of stuff. All right, let's take a breather, everybody. Let's have some fun. Okay, so Matt and Lauren, how are you guys seeing your providers, provider groups that you're working with, how are you guys seeing things change? Lauren, I want to start with you. How are you seeing the communication change of the patient funnel? Talk to us about some of the things you've noticed over the last seven months of quarantine. Yeah, I mean, in addition to, you know, where where it's possible to provide a telehealth offering, and I've seen so many clients go through this incredible journey of propping up telehealth services in a matter of weeks to be able to, to continue to see their patients, you know, when, when the world shut down in early March. Um, one of the things that I think has changed the most, in addition to, you know, changing the way you actually physically provide your service, is that the content that our clients have started to put out there has just changed tremendously. We have seen um, you know, clients that that were primarily just putting out to Alex's point, location page content really targeted towards near me searches and just focusing on on capturing the lead at the very, very last minute when the search intent is there to building out robust content marketing strategies, things like uh, blogs that address, you know, how to uh, find a telehealth provider. Um, how do I select providers in, in this time, uh, in this unprecedented time? And then taking that content and figuring out how to get that in front of their patients who aren't engaging with them in, in the standard ways anymore. So, I mean, I personally think content marketing um, and, and the way that you get that content out there is the thing that I have seen change the most. Mm -hmm. It used to be easy. Set up the location page. You're going to show up here wherever they are and they're going to come to you. Now we've got to educate, nurture, caress, make them feel safe. There's a lot more that has to be done. Matt, how does technology play into that? Are you guys also hearing that from your clients that are coming to you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think 
taking it a little bit higher level, one of the things that we're noticing that's changing in the provider space is that providers are starting to recognize that patients have a preference in the way that they want to be communicated with. That preference matters. And the way that you personalize an experience that you deliver to them, wherever you choose to deliver it to them, whether it's a phone call, a lot of people don't like getting phone calls. If it's direct mail, how do we do direct mail more efficiently and, and in a personalized way? Yeah. When they look at digital right now, they're they're compared to every other brand and every other industry that's reaching out to that same person, that same consumer. So those experiences that you're offering them, they're comparing to the experience with Amazon. They're comparing to their shopping experience when they look for a car or when they shop for groceries or uh, when they go down the street and see a number of different brands that they just walk past and pop in. Right. So th their experience as they uh, are consumers of anything is what they're comparing to the way that they engage with your provider group. So I think recognition of that fact and that that change that providers need to make based on preference and personalization is something that we're starting to see a lot of, of discussion around, a lot of education and, and a lot of uh, evaluation of how can we really help these providers bring that type of personal personalized experience to their patients. I think At the end of the day, what I hear you saying is make it easy for every patient to communicate with you and become an active patient in the way they want to. Yes. Right. And they all have different means. And I saw I saw a stat the uh, yesterday, I think, uh, Dialogue Tax Healthcare Marketing Trend. Eighty percent are still coming through phone calls and they're more qualified than the email leads or live chat or any other any other means. Interesting. Still phone. Our generation is going to change that, baby. I can't stand making a phone call. If I could text the doctor. I would. <laughs> well, well, the, to, to jump in on that stat, I mean, the reason why I'd, one of the reasons why that might be the case is because a phone call and a phone number is really all that's being offered right now. Mm. They can't do anything else because the only thing that they see is contact us. Yeah. Phone number. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. A, that's a, somewhat of a misleading stat potentially. I love that. I love it. Correlation or causation. I love getting into that. On the stats. I love yeah. that. Give them every means, whether it's live chat, booking, booking online, email, phone, any, any kind of way you want to make sure that they can. And I'm sure Salesforce tech allows you to communicate in each way. Uh, in a personalized manner. That's one of the big things you can get with tech is it can personalize outreach. Um, this is a cool stat. All my digital marketers out there, we're finally winning the war. We're finally winning the war, guys. Look at this. 2021, we're going to have more spend online than TV for the first time ever. For the first time ever. 45% of 41. <laughs> I started this agency 11 years ago, and I can't tell you how excited I am that we're finally seeing what's going on. Okay. So this is great. So your patient's going online. We expect this to continue even when we all get vaccinated and we all go back to the, you know, how we used to live next year. We still expect that the majority of spend is going to be online because we've all shifted that way and consumer behavior has changed. Like what Matt was saying, the retailification of healthcare has probably now been expedited from a 10 year process into one year. We've got so many groups that are coming to Matt and I saying, we survived on provider referrals. We survived on our reputation and we grew like crazy walking into hospitals and getting referrals or by word of mouth. Now, none of that works anymore. Please help us. We need to go online. Mm -hmm. So I think we've expedited the growth there digitally in this one year, maybe has done a lot, uh, a lot of good. We might look back and say it did a lot of good. Omni channel marketing. When we talk about it, what are we talking about? So it can include everything from all your digital means like email, social, website with scheduling or your patient feedback, but can also include your print ads. Matt mentioned direct mail. Direct mail works great. How do you personalize it? How do you make sure that it's saying the same thing that the rest of your modes of communication are saying online? Lauren alluded to this earlier, but it's no longer as easy as putting up a location page. Now you almost need like serious content strategy to make sure you're saying the right things to the patient about what they care about because so much has changed and how she thinks about things has changed. But to make sure all those mediums are saying the right things at the right time, that's not so easy, but it's possible with technology and doing the right things, you can retarget people with the right message at the right time. So all kinds of fun stuff. We're going to dive into this in just a minute. Samantha Reed. Should I invest in Omni Channel or is it just a passing trend? Oh my gosh, Samantha Lauren, what do you think? <laughs> well, Alex, you just showed that stat about you know the the change in in healthcare marketing spend. I mean, 
I don't know if I've ever seen one of those charts that shows a change in, in marketing spend go back the other direction. So I don't think it's, it's going to revert back. Um, you know, it, it's going to continue that direction. So the, the social touch points, um, the time spent on mobile devices, time spent on, on, you know, at, in apps on, on your mobile, um, those stats, you know, we could probably pull up a bunch of them grow year over year and they're growing exponentially. So mm -hmm. I don't see a, you know, a, a time in which this is, is ever going to just fade, yeah. uh, you know, get in there now while a lot of companies are considering how do I how do I take advantage of omnichannel marketing? Uh, be an early adopter and and get some learnings now, so that when the time comes next year, that that healthcare marketing in the digital space does exceed the traditional space. Yeah. You've you've got you know the right mix already running. I love that, Samantha. You got a T-shirt. Great question, Matt. Do you agree? Is it good to keep if we if a provider group has moved to digital? Is it good to keep the investment in digital next year when we all go back? Uh, to the way of things, what do you think? Should they increase next year, hold stay? What do you think? Yeah, great, great question. I think the the answer is different depending on how it's actually performing for you and the performance that you're expecting and and monitoring and and analyzing is something that you really have to do day by day in real time. I think a lot of people have questions about whether or not digital is working whether I should make more investments, where should I make more investments, and what audiences and demographic groups should I make investments and target. And, and without an ability to really understand what's happening and the return that you're getting on that on that spend, on those efforts, uh, it, it's really a question that you will always have, right? And your ability to get an answer daily and insight daily on what you should be doing, where you should be investing, and how you can improve what what is already happening is something you can absolutely do with technology. So, yeah. um, you know, th there really isn't an answer of yes, you should or no, you shouldn't. But it is a question you should ask daily, and it's a question that you should look into on a daily basis. To yeah, make daily decisions. It's and the only way to do it is to really tie all, tie yeah. all this together, right, with technology, etc. It's the only way. Yeah, we're getting a number of questions on there. Max, those stats do include, we got the question, uh, do those stats include Hulu, Pandora, or is that in TV? TV's TV, and yes, the digital marketing spend includes, t it includes Hulu, Spotify, Pandora, things like that. Great question, Max. You get a t-shirt, buddy. Uh, Rebecca, thank you. How do you balance investments in traditional versus digital? Great question, Rebecca. I think it's what Matt just alluded to. Monitor, measure as much as you can. And then Alex, I think too, I mean, try to hold some of your offline channels to a similar standard that you hold your digi digital channels to. I think we have a lot of clients that say, you know, my CPA on, on XYZ digital channel isn't great. And, and the question is, do you know that it's better, worse than, equal to some of your offline channels? What can you do to really, you know, push the envelope on your traditional channels to understand how they affect your total, you know, patient acquisition? Um, and, and don't just kind of let them ride as, as this evergreen, you know, I, I can't measure it type of tactic. I think, you know, talking with Matt, there, there are some ways that you can kind of try to tie your offline and your online and omni channel for you may in, involve all of those things. It doesn't have to just involve the digital touch points. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Hold your traditional to the high standard that you hold your digital. Guys, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Please, please. Okay. I understand it doesn't drive leads at the same great cost as search and SEO. That's okay. But you need to hold it to a higher standard. All you hospitals out there that love to have your billboards and your TV, please understand people are online more than ever. Okay. All right. Lauren, take it away. Tell us about how we can uh, nurture them through here. Yeah, so I wanted to start, you know, by by opening up a little bit about how do we get the patient to take that inter that initial interaction with us, and then there is how do I nurture them through the process of actually becoming a patient, right? So a quick look at at. Um, patient acquisition at the very, very beginning of, of the process. I talked a little bit about what I've observed in, in the changes in 
in healthcare. Uh, and I think content is one of the big ones, right? So you've got all of these different stages that a patient is going to have to go through. They're going to go through, you know, becoming aware of a problem. Uh, the example we've used here is, you know, my lower back hurts. What are some of the causes of lower back pain? Um, do I have a spinal injury? Just general awareness of a need, a need for some sort of healthcare solution. Um, and then you've got your interest and consideration. This is where a brand has the opportunity to actually come in and say, hey, I provide a solution to your problem. Consider what I have to say and who I am as a possible solution. So we're talking about things like, you know, how do I manage lower back pain? Can you write a blog about different types of back pain and, and how what some of the solutions are to manage those? Um, you know, a question like, who do I see for back pain? I don't even know what kind of doctor treats back pain. Is it a chiropractor? Do I need to go to an orthopedic surgeon? Do I need to go see my GP? So this is the type of long form content that presents multiple entry points into your brand, not just the, I'm looking for a doctor near me now. So in terms of acquisition, I really want you guys to think about this funnel and I don't want you to just think about the, the action point as the place where you can get someone to interact. I want you to think about it all the way back to just the general awareness of a healthcare need. Yeah, I love it. It's, it starts earlier on than we ever imagined. Yeah, I mean, some of some of the, the ways that you can start to identify where the patient is starting, and I'm gonna show you some examples here in a minute, but, um, long tail keywords. So a, a lot of you, if you are just in your infancy of trying things like paid search, for example, you're probably sitting on what we call the most efficient keywords. And those are the ones with intent. But what about some of the longer form searches like, um, you know, best dentist near me, right? Not just I need a dentist in, you know, 30319. How can you start to look for some of the qualitative modifiers on those terms that are actually you know, the, the healthcare consumer asking a, a general question. Um, I'm not suggesting that location is ever going away. I think to Alex's point, it's just been there a little bit longer and we've probably all got strategies in place to tackle that. Now, what's the next iteration? What's the next wave in that trend? And don't forget that there are multiple entry points. It is not just the bottom, bottom of the funnel. I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. And that's what, that's what leads you to put all of your funds in maybe one or two channels and forget about all of the other opportunities. Um, I wanted to show, you know, a quick example. Again, this one is, is something that you probably know. You probably accounted for this going into 2018, 2019, but it has not gone away. Uh, proximity and reputation now more than ever, about 250% increase in searches, right? But I think what was really cool in one of these examples that I wanted to show you was you may be accounting for, you know, some of those near me searches, people searching based on location, and maybe Google My Business is the entry point for those types of searches. But have you really looked at what Google My Business has done to account for the changing landscape with COVID? Have you, you know, built out your profile to uh, talk about what types of online and virtual care your, your company can offer? Mm -hmm. Have you addressed the question and answers like, do you offer online appointments? Do I have to come in to see a provider? I don't feel comfortable. Um, and do you have your COVID-19 safety information published on the Google search engine so that these patients can make sure that you're that that you are in their consideration set. And then uh, we gave a few webinars around this topic, we won't dive in too much, but then does your G GMB, does your Google My Business match the landing page, guys? Too often we're finding that it doesn't match. You talk you talk a big game about telehealth and walk-in appointments and times you can come in and safety protocols. And then your landing page is just the same old one you ever had. And they're confused that they were looking to learn more. Come on. I think this is this is the really interesting one here, right? And this is uh, these stats where you see these spikes is you know late February, early March. But these are the the changes that you guys need to start considering if you haven't already. And yes, the trend you know hit a peak and maybe coming down slightly, but it's never going to reach the you know pre 2020 trends. Uh, the long tail keywords and the new modifiers that we never thought of before. So safety in the in the keywords is it safe to go to the dentist? Um, virtual appointments on online modifiers. Um, you even see people using, you know, brand names, right? You've seen how, uh, what has happened to Zoom stock, Zoom appointments. So consider those things and the way that people might be searching. What is the true intent behind those searches? 
can you provide an entry point into your brand that isn't just book my appointment now, but really explains what you have to offer against the questions that it is that they're asking. Yeah. And a couple of things, because the shutdowns and everything are fluctuating week to week, you can actually narrow in from United States to your own state. The search volume may get too small for you to get statistically relevant data, but you can narrow in by your state to see how things are getting affected there. And then it's time to go to your SEO company or whoever manages your SEO. If it's Cardinal, it's great. If it's not, it should be. And you ask them and you say, hey, listen, all the keywords that we going, we were going after, are they still relevant? Are there any variations we need this year because of the way behavior on search has changed? That's a very relevant question I'd be asking now. I still think you've got six more months of similar behavior before everybody's vaccinated or trust the damn vaccine. Let's just put it that way. Hi, right, Lauren, what's up? Yeah, I mean, Alex alluded to this already, but you can, you can, you know, talk all day about what your company has to offer, but are, is that message consistent, right? So uh, I've got an example here of, of course, the client that we work with that's doing a very great job at this. Um, but, you know, consistency in not only your, you know, what you present on a, a search engine result, for example, but then, you know, how, when they come and interact with you on a social platform later, are you presenting a consistent message? And then when they get to your website, are you, confident that the content that you've made available to them actually answers the question uh, enough to to make them feel comfortable generating an interaction, whether that's a consult, uh, picking up the phone and calling, have you given them the options to to interact with you in multiple ways? So not just how we are kind of playing the search engine game, but how we're messaging needs to change along with the types of keywords and the types of in, in interactions that we're going for. The whole thing's got to change. Your experience has got to change. You got to open up to virtual tours. I know a lot of groups are really, uh, I'm talking about my senior living, my SNFs, ALs, ILs. They're really nervous to do virtual tours. Like, oh my God, no, the video company wants 40 grand to charge. Guys, shot with an iPhone 10. Okay. We got iPhone 12 coming out. You can walk people around. You can do backyard tours. This doesn't need to be super professional, but people need to see what's going on behind the scenes. By the way, one of the funniest uh, ads I saw for orthodontic group. And by the way, Smile Dog is largest in the country. Our client is great. But I saw an individual orthodontist. I don't remember where it was. You've probably seen it on the web. But it's a uh, it's a woman with a mask on and it says, now's a great time to get braces. Because <laughs> everybody's got, oh my God, I had braces in high school. That was embarrassing. My dad said, hey, we were going to homecoming and my dad said, hey, Alex, can you just take those off for the night? I said, it doesn't work like that, dad, but I wish it did. Thanks for humiliating me. Now I don't want to go to homecoming. All right, let's keep it on par. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, just a few more examples, right? So whether it's acknowledging that times have changed and you're here to support clients through that or, you know, coming up with an entire campaign, you know, hashtagging it, using it across your channels to talk about your safety protocols and really leading with that as a differentiator, um, whatever it is that represents how your brand has adapted lead with that message, lead with that message on your social channels, lead with that message in your email cadences, in your drip campaigns, uh, in your ad copy, in your organic meta titles and meta descriptions, all of those opportunities to kind of tell your patient that that in a consistent manner, what it is that sets you apart. So these were just a few other examples and brands that you guys can uh, feel free to go check out online and, and see what it is that they've been doing. Lauren, question for you. This is just out of my own head. So we're leaving with uh, leading with safety and comfort. Are you finding that ad creative with uh, the doctors or providers or dentists with masks on is more more effective or happy patients smiling or happy patient, whatever it is? Is it patients or safety providers with safety? Which creative is working better? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. What I've seen a lot of of uh, my clients go towards is more of like an animated experience because you may have a lot of first party photography and videography that you spent a lot of money producing in 2019. And you look at it and you see a doctor and a patient and interacting without a mask and it just feels out of place given where we are today. So um, I've seen a lot of, you know, kind of the animated version of that working really well. I mean, every brand has a voice and it's important that you, that you stand by your voice and how you want to be represented. But that's kind of a unique way I've seen a lot of clients, you know, navigate that, you know, the, the imagery question in particular. Delicate balance.
Yep. So, so really one of the, the final things I want to touch on in terms of acquisition, and then we're going to talk about a little bit more about nurture, but um, I, I showed you this funnel a few steps back and I talked about the different types of content, right? So this is an example. Um, how do you know or, or which content is important at these various stages? So uh, this is a client that we have that we have spent, uh, gosh, we've probably added almost a thousand pages to their website since COVID hit. Uh, that's everything from FAQ pages to services, um, podcasts, uh, blogs, you know, resources, anything you could imagine, right? Um, in the awareness stage, as an example, so someone is is wanting to understand is, you know, what it, what is my condition? Is it something I need to get treated? So put content out there that is just simply looking at common questions asked by patients. Maybe you go to your practice admin, you go to the providers, you ask them, what do your patients wanna know when they come in the door? Compile those questions, create an FAQ section on your website. Uh, that content will start to get ranked on search engines and can be an entry point into your practice. Then you've got the interest, right? So yes, I have, you know, I have a, a problem. I have a healthcare need. Uh, how do I then become part of their consideration set, right? So some examples I've put here. Um, we had a client who started a podcast to talk about how mental health can be addressed in this changing world. And we took those podcasts, we transcribed them, and we put them up on their website so that their patients could sit there and watch them and or read them and understand what it is that mental health care even means today. And then uh, when it comes to actually considering coming in the door or creating a virtual appointment with this client, well, what conditions do you even treat? Do you treat what I, what I have, what my condition is? And finally, what you can then do on your website is make sure that, that the actions you want them to take are very clear. And to Matt's point, what I really love about what this client has done is they have onboarded live chat, they have virtual online scheduling, uh, but you can still pick up the phone and call too. So recognizing that that patients want to interact with you the way they want to interact with you, give them the options and allow them to do that. Don't force them into your one system that you have in place. Yeah, it's a great time to go get a content strategist or someone to go talk to your patients and providers and just figure out, are they still finding you in the same ways? Do they still have, do your patients still have the same questions? Go do an audit of things. I and mean, this is a great year to find out if how patients are thinking about you and what's changed. Yeah. Talk us through, uh, talk us through telehealth. Everybody. I mean, I'm sure, you know, what you're going to be able to offer in telehealth is, you know, may have some limitations based on technology. Uh, it may be based on, you know, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's, you know, legalities, but if you can find any way to allow your patient to in engage with you, at least initially, uh, in a virtual manner, I think you have a much stronger chance of kind of bringing them in as a patient long-term, knowing that we're going to get back to some semblance of normal. So I've seen some really unique ways that companies have done this. I mean, I have seen um, dental monitoring kits that that get sent to your house that go on your iPhone and you take a picture of your mouth and you text it to your dentist and they tell you, you know, oh, that tooth looks like it's moved. You know, I mean, some really unique stuff. I've seen, um, you know, LASIK consultations being done online now so that you can at least consult and talk to a patient about whether it's a right fit for them. Um, you guys, even if even if it feels like virtual and, and telehealth appointments doesn't make sense for your brand, consider if you can at least get that initial touch point available to them. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, is there any technology on the Salesforce site that can help with getting these messages out or personalize as, as any kind of ad components? Is yeah. Any yeah, absolutely. Actually, b before I go there, one of the things that I wanted to, to add in here is, is that a lot of times telehealth is very new for patients and they don't know what to do and they know that it's available and they're happy that it's available, but it's hard for them to figure out. They don't know exactly how to use the app, how to use which should which part of my phone should I use? There's a lot of different um adoption related problems that patients are experiencing using telehealth for the first time. So your, your question was, is there any technology that can help spread spread the awareness to patients that telehealth is available? Absolutely. But but even even more so, I'd say what what's important, what we're seeing people use our technology for 
is, is educating patients around how to use it and how to okay. use it effectively. Because if it doesn't matter if you have it, if patients mm-hmm. aren't able to adopt it in you. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's, that's really a standout from what we've seen re- very recently that, um, you know, they've made investments in telehealth. They have either a technology that they've they've spent money on or they've potentially maybe even built it themselves. And they really need to make sure patients understand how to use it, how to access it and what to do afterward. So that, yeah. that's my. Matt, take. that's a really great point. Uh, you know, I mentioned one of our clients, we've added probably thousands of pages to their site. And one of the, the robust sections of this, so we built an entire section of the site uh, with video content on how to, how do, how do I even facilitate an appointment? You know, do I, are you going to call me? Am I going to call you? You yeah. know, what time should I log in at? Should I be there early? You know, I mean, there's just so many questions about the category as a whole. So I think that's a really, really fantastic point. Yeah. Matt or Lauren, either one of y'all know, what is the proportion of if total patient, new patients acquired for provider groups, what percentage generally come through telehealth? Is it, is it, is it really heavy? Is it, is it, come down some? Do we have any data? Do we know? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd kick that over to Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to um, a couple examples of just kind of where the numbers sit Give it in the past, you know, seven months or so. Um, you know, I, I've got clients who were, you know, maybe 90-10 in March and, and are, are scaled back now to about 50-50. Um, right. I think a lot, of, a lot of prospective clients that I meet with and I, I'm asking them, where do you want these numbers to sit? Do you find that virtual makes more sense for your business and you want to continue down that path? I think a lot of companies would love to see 50% of their business come through virtual and 50% in person. And that doesn't mean the numbers I used to have cut in half 50%. It means I can grow my business 100% on top of what it already was. Mm -hmm. A lot less overhead and the mid-levels can take a ton of the the virtual appointments. So a lot more efficient Mm -hmm. unless they need to uh, really need to see a provider. So talking about the variety of nurture campaigns, a lot of you guys think of nurture just as email. We'll talk about email first, but actually all the channels can interact. Um, And there's a lot of different things you can do. And guys, you got to be careful with any of this kind of stuff because because of HIPAA and a million other reasons. Anytime you're emailing, I just want to put this caveat, do not imply condition uh, or any of your advertising, do not imply condition, let's not do anything creepy. But even within that, Email can be incredibly useful for reactivations. For my low acuities that you're going to get reactivations like urgent care, dental, behavioral, uh, this can be super useful. And a lot of your offline activities can be trigger events, especially post or pre-COVID, whether you're having an in-person event or seminar for my IVFs out there, you can use email to do a lot of reactivations, whether it's time for six months and time to come back into a cleaning. Use your email campaign and guys, you need something. I love MailChimp. They're in Atlanta. They got my heart. They didn't go to get VC money, but you need something more sophisticated. If you really start to scale your practice out, some uh, dirt, uh, some kind of email email platform that's going to be a bit more sophisticated and allow you to personalize your messaging in bigger buckets. Matt, do you know of any email <laughs> software that could do yeah. something? Yeah, I do. There, there's a couple of points that you just made that I, I would actually even start with before I pitch Salesforce stuff. No. I think your 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 the way that you began is is uh, a warning about HIPAA. Something to know about email platforms, email technology that are out there is that s- some email technologies are not HIPAA compliant, but some are. And I think that that's a really big differentiator in the in the healthcare space. Marketing Cloud specifically has an email uh, a a HIPAA compliant email platform called Exact Target. But as you as you look at um, the way that email is being used, what what we find, which I think is really relevant for the way that we started most of this webinar, is that the the channels interplay with one another. So as you start to think about how to use email and, and you start to watch how your email is working, things like monitoring your open rate, your click rate, are these emails being uh, um, revisited multiple times? Some of that insight is really helpful, but insight that we've gathered and we've we've been collecting and really monitoring is the relationship between email and ads and the ability to coordinate an experience where you may start with email, but if you've noticed that that email has not been engaged with, it hasn't been opened, but it has been delivered, pairing a digital ad to that exact person in a targeted way with the same message that's on that email can help you actually drive them back to email 
and increase your open rates. So, a great segue. Well, let's go, just go ahead and skip a slide. I, we, that, yeah. not Thank you. It's perfect. Guys, email is one touch point, but if you're having trouble reactivating people, you can all use all kinds of different ad activations to get them back engaged, whether it's Facebook with a certain kind of retargeting ad, once again, not in plain condition, or your web content, RLSA ads, which are uh, people that have gone to Google, didn't click on your link the first time, but came back to Google, did a different search, you can serve them those ads. You can come back with an Instagram video that's personally targeted based on a certain, certain subsect of the people in your CRM. So it's exactly what Matt was alluding to. Don't just rely on email for activations. There's so much more you can do, guys, so much more. And you use these different touch points at different stages of the patient funnel. If they're not quite in the decision phase, then you really wanna serve different types of content. If you only have one remarketing ad on Facebook and it's just like a provider testimony or a patient testimonial, you're probably missing the boat on a ton of people that just were not ready to see the testimonial yet. They still have questions about whether or not they need surgery. They don't wanna see the patient testimonial yet. They need to be educated. So we really recommend come with different types of remarketing campaigns. You can launch different kinds of remarketing ads based on the pages people saw, how interested they were on your, on your website and things like that. And then use email to nurture them across the spectrum, right? As soon as they come in and they're an active patient, you should have some kind of drip campaign that changes based on the buyer or the patient flow and how engaged they are with your brand. And they get put into different segments. It's kind of more advanced nurture stuff. But that's really that's really where you guys want to go. Please do yeah. not do the same content to everybody. Yeah, Alex, if I could jump in here, yeah. if that's all right. That good time. To do. Okay, perfect. So, one of the things that I think is really important here to to call out, and and some may be here in in their digital transformation journey, and and some really haven't approached this this concept yet, but. When people start to use digital, when, when provider groups and hospitals really begin to think about the way to do this, it's no longer uh, a, a one size fits all type of model. It's no longer this e this group or this list gets this email, this list gets this email, this list gets this ad, so on and so forth. It's different for every single person individually. And what technology does, whether you use it yourself or whether you use it as a go-between with your agency, is it allows you to really target and, and dynamically modify and personalize which channels are applied when to every single person in a one-to-one -one way. So you move away from this list model and this group campaign uh, 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 concept, and you really begin to offer the right the right message on the right channel at the right time to every single individual person based on how they're interacting with all of those messages. It could be a different journey, if you will, for every single person. And, and that's really where people are starting to grow and, and, and look at digital transformation to, when they want to think about how do we be more personalized in the way that we engage our patients. So I, I think that might be a really good call out for this slide specifically. Yeah, so much fun. I can't wait till we all get that advanced. That's exactly where we need to be. It's so irrelevant when you get some kind of message that has nothing to do with where you're at. Right. Or what we're thinking about right message, right time, right person. Right. Yeah. Uh, Samantha Reed asking a great question. How should you move towards omni-channel with a big bang or incremental change? Oh my gosh, I have a different opinion than these guys. Uh, <laughs> Lauren and Matt, what's your thinking? Do you start small or do you just... <laughs> You just go all content platforms at the same team, see same time, see what sticks. I, I got an answer, but Lauren, go ahead. I'll, I'll come over. Top. We'll see if our answers align. I mean, when I'm consulting with with prospective clients on, you know, actually bringing on a digital agency and expanding into these platforms, the one thing I never want any of my clients to do is spread themselves so thin across every channel that you're not effective in any of the channels, right? Yeah. So maybe it's a matter of, look, I have the following budget for 2021 and the areas that, you know, that are going to be most effective from a stepping stone perspective, in addition to using, you know, the exact target email, um, uh, the journey builder would be to layer on, you know, a social touch point and perhaps a remarketing touch point, right? And I, what I want you to do is collect enough data in in the channels that you're using to determine if they're effective, and and not just think that you need to be on, you know, twenty different channels, and you're just kind of very scratching the surface on those. I mean, that would be my recommendation. But Matt, I'd love to hear what what you think. Yeah, yeah. For, first off, I think. 
any way that you choose to go is okay. As long as you don't freeze up and wait and stall and, and don't do anything. I think a lot of people don't know the answer. They're, they're worried about uh, the mistake of investing in something that may not work. And ultimately they choose to do nothing. I think that's the only mistake that, that people should avoid. Whether you start small or whether you start big, you know, the, the evaluation of the opportunity that's at hand, it, it really can help guide you. So we work with some companies that after evaluating what's possible, you know, comparing expected results based on successful projects that are identical to what they're hoping to be able to do. Once you start to evaluate what the return on investment could be, if it works just as well as it did for, you know, company B, that that can really help guide or, 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 or help you feel more comfortable making a larger investment than you may have originally thought was appropriate. That that opportunity, that business value um, that that you can really start to get very specific and granular on how to how to project what's possible can be really eye opening. A lot of people just aren't taking it to that stage and, and you know, that that question that they're they're facing. So I'd say sit down and do the math, work with somebody like Cardinal or, or your Salesforce team to help you break it down. And I think that might be telling to figure out how how big or how small you start. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think I'll, I'll I think add one, is- <laughs> I, let me add one thing to that real quick. I mean, I love what you said, Matt. And I, I think the best types of engagements that I see, and, and this may be, you can engage with your internal team like this. If you have one, you can engage with your agency like this, but but go go talk with whoever you need to talk with about what is the business objective, right? And then work backwards. I think sometimes you go out there and you say, well, this company is doing Facebook, so I'm, I want you to execute Facebook for me. Is that the right place to be? Is that where your patients are spending their time? I, I really think the most effective use of of any marketing dollar you have is is to work backwards from the goal and, and not start with the tactic and try to work towards mm-hmm. the business objective. One one channel at a time. Get really good at it. Hedgehog into there. And then once it's plateaued, try something else. What Matt said, a good decision today is better than a perfect decision tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Move fast, fail fast, move on. All right, let me shrink our faces back again. I love playing with this thing. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, I just I'll talk through a couple <laughs> slides really quickly. I want to make sure we we allow for a little bit more Q and A. But I think one of the misconceptions in lead acquisition versus lead nurture is that it's a different set of tactics and tools. It is the same tactics that we're talking about here, guys. So it's it's the web content, it's layering on the social touch points, it's layering on the remarketing touch points where you're allowed to do it. Um, it's it's making sure your reputation not only generates the initial touch point, but doesn't um, you know deter from from making the taking the final action. So I'm talking about the same types of tactics here, just a, maybe a, a slightly different way of using them. One of the things that uh, that Matt said that's that's really awesome was uh, changing the content based on the interaction prior. So it's not just a single funnel that I'm going to push everyone through it regardless of how they've interacted with my brand. And content, dynamic web content is a really cool way to do this. Uh, this is you know, very similar to some of the ways that you can uh, set up email campaigns, right? And this can talk to your email campaigns too. But consider you know, placing some, some areas on your site where you ask a question to the prospect, allow them to select an answer with where they are in their decision process, and then present them with the the content that that best answers that question. So it's not that every single, you know, prospective um, patient looking for a solution is going to have the same series of questions. And I think the example that that Alex and I had used here was, um, and looking for for senior living facilities. So what is most important to that prospect at any point in time, make sure that's what you're leading with and sometimes allow them to tell you that. You don't have to always just assume that you know what they're thinking. Yeah, and guys, there's all kinds of fun things you can do with personalization now by matching the keyword they searched on Google to a, to a different landing page based on what they search. If they search senior living pricing near me, It'll dynamically show a different page with the with the pricing block in comparison to other senior living homes near me on a web page than it would if they search for something else. So it's called personalization. Look in it, Google if you want to learn more. Something new we're doing for clients. 
Lauren, if it's okay, we kind of talked about a few of yep. these things. I think we need to, let's get to technology and leave a few minutes for, uh, for Q&A. That's fine, guys. You're going to be emailed all this fun stuff. So make sure you're doing all these fun things we're talking about with remarketing and varieties of, uh, uh, of different Facebook and Insta remarketing ads. So Matt, walk us through some of the technology. What's out there? What's out there? Either yeah. beginner, beginner provider group or very advanced. What do they need to be looking at? What, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, to, to begin, I, I think that it's important to understand that marketing technology has exploded over the past couple of years. Yeah. The, the options that are out there are, are really endless. And, and a lot of times provider groups really get fatigued at, at, at just understanding what is a different differentiator between all these different options. I think one of the things that, that I think is relevant for this webinar specifically in this topic is when you think about omnichannel, using the concept of a platform as opposed to an interconnected web of point solutions is the biggest differentiator that we, we try to really base our conversations around with Salesforce. There, there are tools specifically for social that only do social that are disconnected in many ways to the way that you're using data for digital advertising, the way that you're bringing back the results from those digital advertising campaigns. The disconnection then translates into having a point solution for email. And when you have very specific tool sets for each channel that, that doesn't take advantage of one unified data model, one, one place where all of the data, all of the interactions, all of the opens and the clicks and the, the views and the, um, you know, the, the replies from all of those different channels coming into one area, allowing you to adapt and change the way that you then place the next message in front of that person or segment that patient into a different group or a different area of interest. That's really where the value starts to, to become exciting with yeah. what we do. I'll be very quick. I know we don't have much time, but the, the concept here is that your ability to engage across the entire patient journey is a real time, real time capability. With Marketing Cloud specifically, if you're a Salesforce user, the big thing that you want to understand is that we are interconnected and built on top of the world's number one CRM. You have one source of truth by being able to see every touch point and all, all data that you have on that patient in one area. It's scalable, it's flexible, and time to value is very, very fast. We're also very well supported by a number of different Self-help tools, Trailhead is really, really great. If you go one more slide to the right, I also want to end on, um, it, advance the slide. Uh, yeah, there we go. I want to end on just the, the acknowledgement that we have a platform that takes into consideration almost every need that you would have for these mar omni-channel marketing campaigns. Your ability to know your patient, your ability to personalize the engagement, your ability to engage across any channel and then measure how it all worked is what this platform that you see here is, is really built to do. There's a ton of different individual product names. I won't get into that. That's probably less important than the message that no matter what you need, no matter where you want to focus, we have a tool or combination of tools to help you do it. Yeah. And if you're wondering, do I need to invest in this? Guys, it's, the, it, it's like I said before, it's the accelerant to what your agency or your internal team can do. We only have so much data because it's very difficult to tie marketing platforms to CRM and everything in Service Cloud together. With Salesforce and some of these tools, you tie it all together. You better understand your patients. And it's the accelerant to go and getting more patients. Things like their analytics tool can reduce your cost per new patient because it's going to make your advertising way more efficient because you're going to know which campaigns drive yeah. the most efficient patient. There's no way any agency can know that without things like these Salesforce technologies. Guys, 259. I think you did great. We killed it here. I promised a hundred dollar Amazon and then we're going to leave some time for Q and A for anybody that wants to stay after. I know y'all don't have a anywhere to go because none of us have anywhere to go. So we can stay for five, 10 minutes after. And uh, let me hear, let me see who won the gift card. In the meantime, go over to chat and please put in your questions now. Samantha, great questions. You already got a t-shirt, $100 gift card for you if we didn't already get you one. Dana, thank you so much uh, for your kind words. Let's get a notice. Get your questions in now. 
Let's get to it. All right, guys, pulled at random. I promise, Greg, you're so active, but you're the winner. <laughs> you already got the gift on the gift card. Get another one. If you got a teacher, you get the gift card too. So congratulations, guys. Congratulations. Greg's helping us answer the questions as well. Thanks, yeah, Greg. Greg was answering some of the other people <laughs> chatting. I love it. <laughs> Greg, we got to get you on the next panel, buddy. Um, uh, let me shut this thing down and we'll just do some, some Q and a, a lot of things, Matt, like, uh, I know a lot of provider groups are so nervous to invest in the technology. And I think it's just like, they don't know if, if with technology, they can crawl before they run, but there's a lot of, a lot of tools that Salesforce has that are crawling tools and they help yeah. get you ready to run with an agency or on your own. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that this, without making this a, a super complex answer, every single tool that we have has a has a basic version, a basic yeah. package that is stripped down. It's yeah. um, it has the basics of what you need and allows you to really grow over time. So, uh, yeah. no matter where you want to start, no matter what your budget is, we we have yeah. a tool that can help you and and bring new capabilities into your Salesforce environment. Yeah, so, yeah. And it's like Matt said, don't be afraid of starting. It's better to start and maybe screw something up than to have never started alone at all. All of yeah. us marketers, we got to where we were. It's like the Thomas Edison thing with the light bulb. We just found 10,000 ways how not to acquire a patient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We figured out what works. So guys, keep at it, all my marketers out there. Thank you for all your great questions. Uh, if you need to get in contact with us, just Google Healthcare Marketing Agency, probably number one, and you can find us that way, okay? <laughs> Lauren and Matt, thanks for joining me on this uh, very fun webinar roundtable. This was awesome. Everybody out there, we're going to email it out to you if you have any questions. Matt Kelly, search for him on LinkedIn. Just type in Matt Kelly, the best-looking uh, account executive in, you, uh, in the United States, and you'll probably find him that way. Uh, Lauren and I are also here for any questions you have. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lauren. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, see you all.